uh, we're very fortunate in Vermont to have a congressional delegation that uh, is very supportive of environmental causes, causes, very educated, very knowledgeable, and is engaged on a national uh, stage to, uh, to meet the needs of Vermonters and all Americans. And along with those congressional delegations, probably the key people are those uh, field field representatives that uh, that uh, support things here on at home. And our next speaker, Tom Barry, has a lot of experience in this area. You, I guess you could call him a political junkie to some extent. Uh, Tom has worked for uh, Senator Leahy since. Uh, 2009 and then prior to that worked for 10 years for Senator Jeffords and uh, has also done some work for with uh, Senator Sanders office. Uh, Tom was a resident at the University of Vermont Rubenstein School for two years working on issues related to Lake Champlain uh, for the Nurture Conservancy uh, and the balance of Tom's professional career has been involved in uh, town and municipal and city planning and regulations. Uh, Tom has a MS in, uh, in stream ecology from the University of Michigan, and with that, we'll turn it over to Tom Barry. This, uh, yeah, this seems to be working. I'll, I'll hide behind the podium, a little bit, a little bit taller. Um, Steve will be probably quicker with a hook since I'm not his boss's boss um, up here. And what, what uh, uh, wasn't said in my bio is, is I'm also the, uh, the father of Emily Berry, who's a, a junior at another institution studying forest ecology and education and hoping to go into research in academia. So anybody here can tell me how to talk her out of it. Um, uh, I'll be around all day. Uh, and. Uh, but uh, Emily and I are kind of in the same place, same place in our schedules this week. You know, and it, a lot of people here are associated with the with the university. I'm I'm not going to be doing email. I'm just going to pull this out so I can watch the clock, so Steve doesn't have to get the hook out. Um, and uh, you know, every we come into a semester, an academic year, and and uh, muck around with a little bit of research and a little bit of meetings and some classes, and then of course we do all of our work in the last couple of days, and and that's where Emily is right now, and that's where we are right now in uh, in Congress after a two-year Congress of um, you know getting a few things done and talking about a lot of stuff. We're getting all of the work done today and tomorrow, and then we uh, go home, and the new Congress comes in in January, and we could point the finger at recent Congresses as being less functional than some may have been in the past, but uh, this really is standard operating procedure and, uh, and, and is probably based on the same aspects of human nature that, that kind of drives the academic calendar as well. And so uh, that puts me in a position both of uh, being a little distracted today, but also being able to talk about some stuff that's happening right now and that um, you know, impacts a lot of our lives uh, professionally and personally and, and leads into the discussions that we're having today. And, and that is that we're, we're passing some legislation uh, now and the, uh, um, I'm not sure it made the headline news, hopefully it will, but um, you know, the spending bills are queued up to pass and that's, that's great news. We're gonna get an omnibus spending bill done, it looks like, and so for those federal agency people here today, um, you know, we hope to send you home for Christmas knowing what your spending looks like for the balance of the FY15 year. And for those who are looking at federal funding for some of their work or wanna know where things are gonna land, we're gonna get that done. Um, the good news in the federal spending bill from a somewhat selfish perspective representing Senator Leahy on um, Lake Champlain issues is we've got some very good news on the EPA funding for Lake Champlain work. Uh, that's an account that came in last year at uh, 1.4 million dollars. It was a million dollar cut from the year before. Uh, this year that's at 4.4 million dollars for Lake Champlain work. And uh, on top of that, the other account that the Senator is most directly involved with related to Lake Champlain work, the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission account, is looking as gonna come in at $3.5 million. So that's about $8 million on, on Lake Champlain in an account where we had much less last year. And um, puts me in a position, and um, I may wander back to this as I go on. If you talk about science and policy 
Uh, these dollars that, that I've just mentioned that Senator Leahy has worked for over many years, and I see my predecessor in this job, Bob Paquin's here, these were, both these, these accounts were um, established on Bob Paquin's watch, uh, working for the Senator. Um, I believe there's been a consistent effort over the years to keep these dollars closely associated with good science. And uh, I don't know, is there any bad science? I don't know. But I, Eric Howe is here from the Basin Program. And last week, I was able to look in sort of at the last minute on a meeting of the Lake Champlain Basin Program Technical Advisory Committee. And it's a room full of uh, academics and uh, natural resource policy people all of them around the table, uh, well-educated and well-qualified. Well the group in the past has been chaired by Mary Watson of the Rubenstein School. Breck Bowden has chaired it. Uh, it's, it's very focused on um, bringing science to bear on policy outcomes. And that group was prioritizing the projects which they will put forward for, for funding. And it is that prioritization which is most looked to by the Lake Champlain Basin Program Steering Committee, co-chaired by David Mears, um, in making spending decisions. A week ago when I was at that meeting, I didn't know whether there'd be any money there. Now I can say that there will be money there and the, most of the priorities that were established by this technical working group uh, will probably be funded. And so, uh, you know, sometimes it works. We, we, we have um, spending decisions, research decisions that are being prioritized by um, a group of agency people, academics, um, research scientists, and, and uh, uh, hopefully through a rigorous and, and uh, transparent process, and we're actually going to deliver the money this year, we did not last year, to um, implement uh, those programs. And so, um, you know, one of the questions that comes up is how do we influence policy outcomes with science? And uh, if you have the opportunity to get on the Technical Advisory Committee or to otherwise work with policy groups and bring your science to that table, there are times when, when we can um, deliver some outcomes there. I'm going to um, kind of wander back to the spending um, bills that are, have moved forward simply because I know there are people in the room that are directly affected by it and it does affect the question of, um, no, I'm sitting in the middle instead of to the side here, um, uh, it, it, does, it does affect where we go with science. Um, and so what the spending bills are looking like uh, are most of the, uh, of the uh, elements of the federal uh, FY15 appropriations that do impact the, the, the work of research uh, are going to be about level funded. We're going to come through, I guess, in the grand scheme of things, pretty much okay. The National Science Foundation, the Agricultural Research Service, and the National Institutes for Health are up a mm, little bit less than a percent, doesn't keep up with inflation, but uh, they're, they're uh, about level funded. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is um, up just a bit from last year. Uh, in, in the Commerce, Justice, and State Bill, uh, which um, is NASA and NOAA. Sea Grant is, uh, is, is here in, uh, at the university. Um, that's uh, down 3%, uh, a bit of a hit, but the programs most focused on science don't seem to have taken that hit. Um, the U.S. Geological Survey is about level funded. The Department of Energy is, is up a bit, and uh, the U.S. Forest Service is up as well, although I think that's mostly associated with some of the firefighting activities. And uh, I, I did want to take a deep dive into the uh, Forest Service budget to look at some of the uh, state and private forestry titles, et cetera. Um, I haven't been able to do that, but hopefully in the next few days, I, I know a few of you have my, my phone number, feel free to reach out as to what these things look like. So the spending bills will be um, uh, passed. Now the EPA uh, took uh, significant hit. Um, their their uh, accounts that might, you know, the Lake Champlain accounts in great shape. Uh, those type of external accounts are in good shape, but um, their administrative and program budgets took a big hit, and I think that's a sign of things to come going into the next Congress, um, the, where the leadership, many many in leadership, have singled out the EPA as an agency um, that. Uh, um, needs to be uh, beat up upon a bit. And so we're going to see some of that coming at us. Uh, not all good news in these spending bills, and this gets us pretty quickly into the conversation of, of science and uh, policy. There are, were a number of um, fairly uh, 
stinky, <laughs> onerous, difficult riders attached. Uh, didn't make it particularly easy for uh, uh, Senator Leahy, who hasn't um, had the opportunity to vote on the bill yet, but will, to support the bill. Um, but uh, there, there, uh, um, there will be some anti-environmental riders associated with the bill. And uh, they tell us something about the role of, of science and research. Um, and I'll, I'll mention that uh, uh, some of these riders um, uh, willfully ignore science. Others prohibit the uh, collection of data. And um, uh, so a, an example, um, one, one of the uh, riders on the EPA bill uh, prohibits um, the EPA from collecting data on greenhouse gas emissions from uh, manure pits, manure lagoons, manure handling facilities. And so um, not only does it um, take the step of potentially ignoring the science on climate change, it actually um, uh, does not allow the EPA to collect the data that could bolster their, uh, a regulatory approach or other approaches to uh, mitigating greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. Uh, fiasco around some of the emails that got out. Um, the climate scientists were going after personally as well. But when the scientists coalesced in the International Plan on Climate at the UN, all of a sudden you have a uh, body of scientific evidence and a body of scientists that becomes uh, a group that you can't attack on a personal level or on a study-by-study -study level. And so working together um, in associations, in groups, with the university, et cetera, can not only strengthen your voice, but um, make your work less subject to uh, direct attack um, or, uh, or your passion on it um, being dismissed as, as, as simply you know, some, some crazy tree hugger who uh, really doesn't have any view of reality. If you can get associated with a, a larger group, and that I think is the, the largest nas internationally, worldwide, one of the examples of where that has had a huge impact. Uh, but it can be done on a much smaller scale too. Uh, and uh, there's lots of opportunities, and I've pointed to any number of them, to communicate, in Vermont at least, with, with policymakers. They're in the room today, uh, all of them wearing very comfortable shoots, muck boots up here, that's great. Uh, we, lo we love the snow, we can, uh, we can all wear our, our favorite shoes. Um, but you know, we're all here today, a lot of us, and, and you can communicate with us. Um, and then uh, also, uh, you weigh in on a lot of the uh, uh, the issues, and I'll, I'll come back to a few of them that I'm working on now that I could use some advice on, and I'll go, go to a couple that, uh, that the Secretary talked about, um, and, uh, and try to not do it in a way that um, takes anything away from state policy making, but here at the end of the Congress, that one of the next votes, bills that we vote on is a tax extender bills, which extends the production tax credit for wind, and we probably would not be building Ridgeline Wind without that. Um, Secretary Markowitz ran, ran through some of the issues around that. Well, we're in decision-making mode now, and I have to say there's a little bit of an active debate among, uh, well, between myself and my counterpart in D.C., and we're the ones that advise the senator on this protection tax production tax credit. Um, you know, I've seen the pictures of what looks like a string of Walmarts being built along the ridge, ridge line up in Lowell. Uh, it's not a pretty sight. Um, I've looked at information provided to me by passionate advocates, and so you take it with a grain of salt, that in fact, over the lifetime of this project, we're not going to create anything like renewable energy. And oh, by the way, maybe it's being sold two or three times by the utilities. This is what I'm hearing. On the other hand, in, in D.C., you know, the focus is more on the global issue of climate change and the fact that we need to uh, incentivize renewable energy at every turn. So where's the science that helps me inform Senator Leahy as to whether he should support the protection, production tax credit for wind uh, or do we just take a step back at the federal level and say renewable energy is good and we'll leave it to Secretary Markowitz and her team to decide whether uh, the mountaintops in Vermont are the right place to build it, which is kind of where we are now. But we have coming with it at us a major wind turbine project, which is through the EIS process and in the courts uh, on national forest land in, in southern Vermont. And uh, right next to wilderness areas that uh, Senator Leahy was um, instrumental in establishing. So uh, how do we interact on that project? Um, does 
does Ridgeline Wind pencil out in the long run? Um, can we get some science behind it? And uh, you know, another thing I was going to point to as far as uh, uh, another interesting one on science, and, and um, then I'd, I'd also like to hear about cormorant control in Lake Champlain. Who can tell me what we should do there? How much money should we spend? Should we not spend? How do we study it? Uh, got a few comments on sea lamprey control too, but I've already gotten the three minute flag. Um, I'll mention one other thing historically which is interesting, which is um, looking at wilderness and uh, uh, we worked when I was with Jeffords and Bob and I were you know we put in a lot of miles together worked for six years on a wilderness bill the advocates came at us with we need to do wilderness because scientifically we need to do wilderness to protect everything that's out there um, and I'll say over a six-year period whereas the uh, folks that are more interested in resource extraction took scientific positions in a different direction and I'll say over the six years that I worked on that with some scientific knowledge I was never convinced one way or the other on whether there was a scientific basis for establishing wilderness areas in Green Mountain National Forest but politically it was um, a, and uh, for a lot of other reasons, we went there and it was the right thing to do. Um, now I've heard a few people beginning to talk about more wilderness areas. So what's the scientific basis for wilderness? And Jamie Fidel, who's going to speak um, uh, shortly, has been running a group um, for a long time now uh, where all of the forest uh, advocates on both sides, um, you know, cut the tree, hug the tree, get around a table uh, three, four times a year and at least try to find points where they can agree on science and see whether that informs policy. There's no guarantee that, that they'll reach those agreements, but there are scientists around the table um, uh, and uh, I usually attend as do other congressional staff and a number of state staff and so those discussions can help inform policy, but that's another, you know, another issue where it ultimately became a a political decision, uh, the right one, I think, but it was really difficult to get to the bottom of the science. Um, with that, I, I see Steve's getting out the hook, so um, I don't know if we got time for a couple questions, or um, I hope to be here for the rest of the day as well. Thank you, Tom. Well, the, I guess the ways I mentioned to influence policy, let's talk about it one-on-one, -on -one, give me some background on it, and I'll see what the Senator Lay's office can do. And then if there are some larger organizations you work with, um, uh, certainly uh, you know, put together information that's digestible, you know. Uh, I often will look at the introduction and uh, the, the executive summary and the conclusions on a scientific paper and maybe not get through the body of it, but uh, communicate that in more detail and then let's talk about what the policy outcomes could be. Uh, we'll probably be fighting holding actions on endangered species for at least the next couple of years, but we've done that before uh, and, and uh, you know, the world's not uh, coming to an end in January, it was just, uh, we're repositioning. Another question? Um, could you just, um, elaborate on the Ridgeline Wind Project and the significant the EPA is taking to sort of direct impact on the There'll be fewer, uh, EPA resources to, to commit to projects, and so um, I use the, the upcoming TMDL uh, as an example, Total Maximum Daily Load Plan for Lake Champlain. The EPA has been very present in Vermont, uh, presenting that plan. They're very hands-on in developing it, overseeing that process. They, you know, uh, uh, worked hand-in-hand -hand with our agency, not to resources. As their administrative capacity goes down, their ability to commit that kind of energy, science, and thought. You know, it's a science-based, a uh, lot, of, lot of modeling's been done. If they don't have those resources, then, you know, we could end up, if we're doing this starting now and going over the next several years, we could end up with a, a quick and dirty um, TMDL, not as thoroughly thought out, without the kind of outreach that the EPA has put into this particular project. Um, and so, uh, 
you just see less capacity on the part of the EPA to, um, you know, really probably to bring science into play uh, and, and to do the kind of public outreach and regulatory uh, work that they're, um, they're so good at. Thank you. Tom. Thank you.